Um, so having looked at uh, the definition of virtualization and virtual machines, we'll actually dive into how you could uh, virtualize one component of the computer architecture, which is the CPU itself. Um, and specifically, I'll start off with system ISA virtualization. Uh, as I showed you a couple of slides back, uh, the system ISA primarily consists of the control registers, the memory management unit, the I.O. devices, and so on. Um, the virtual machine monitor itself sits on the underlying hardware and manages all of the hardware's resources. And this means that the monitor itself, for example, must control the hardware interrupts. It should have its own interrupt handlers installed on the underlying hardware. Uh, it, should have its, uh, it should have direct access to the I.O. devices and so on. But this would mean that any access to this set of resources, like interrupts and I.O. devices and uh, control registers and so on, should actually be virtualized as far as the virtual machines themselves are concerned. And the virtual machines should not be given direct access to the underlying hardware's resources, primarily because of isolation. Uh, uh, reasons, um, which is why the, the virtual machine's system ISA itself would actually be primarily in memory, and the virtual machine monitor would actually interpose and uh, you know, manage the accesses of the virtual machine uh, to these system resources on its behalf. And the system instructions themselves are actually implemented as emulation functions inside of the virtual machine monitor. So for example, instead of the hardware directly raising an interrupt uh, for the guest, the virtual machine monitor would actually, uh, when appropriate, raise a virtual interrupt or inject a virtual interrupt into the guest. And instead of the guest directly accessing all of the physical memory of the underlying hardware, the virtual machine monitor will actually mediate accesses of the guest to the memory through virtualization, through memory virtualization. So one way you could imagine doing this sort of system ISA virtualization would be instruction interpretation, where the idea is you would actually emulate the fetch decode execute pipeline in software. So uh, you, know, you, you could imagine the virtual machine monitor interposing at every instruction boundary of the guest and emulating that instruction semantics for the guest and then passing control to the next instruction. This would obviously be fairly straightforward to implement, um, and it would have fairly minimal complexity because you're essentially mimicking the underlying hardware's semantics, you know, basically looking, looking up a, a couple of uh, thousand pages of Intel's manuals or ARM's manuals and so on. Um, the negatives would be that it's terribly, terribly slow. Um, and this obviously uh, does not satisfy one of the important properties, which is performance, uh, that we looked at in the formal definition of virtualization. Given that interpretation is not going to be feasible, another way you could imagine doing the system ISA virtualization would be trap and emulate, where the idea is um, you would actually allow the guest operating system and the guest's applications to run directly on top of the underlying hardware, or underlying CPU, for example, uh, almost all the time, except whenever it executes an instruction that is uh, what we call sensitive. Basically, whenever it executes an instruction uh, that actually requires interposition by the virtual machine monitor, we actually uh, uh, fault into the underlying hardware's uh, you know, system layer, which is the virtual machine monitor. And we, the, the virtual machine monitor itself would handle that fault. And during the fault handling, would actually emulate the appropriate semantics as far as the guest's state is concerned. For example, it might actually perform a particular operation as per the guest's set of registers rather than the current underlying hardware's set of registers. Um, and the, the faults themselves could be of different kinds. Uh, you know, I, I'll be going into uh, each one of these while talking about the specific topics. But suffice it to say for now that there are different kinds of traps that actually uh, pass control from the guest's execution on the underlying hardware to the virtual machine monitor's fault handlers, which would ultimately do the emulation required and pass back control. The advantage of the trap and emulate model is, of course, that most of the guests uh, instructions. Most of the virtual machines' instructions would actually run directly on top of the hardware, except for these what we call sensitive instructions. Um, 
coming to the definition of sensitive instructions, uh, you know, Popek and Goldberg actually defined a, a processor or a, or a given mode in a processor as strictly virtualizable if, when executed in a lesser privileged mode, either all the instructions that access the privileged state would trap, or all the instructions would either trap or execute identically in both of the um, modes, uh, both privileged and unprivileged modes. So the idea here is that if, as long as you uh, have this guarantee that either all instructions are, uh, that access privileged state are going to trap, uh, or they're at least going to trap or execute identically in both privileged and unprivileged modes, you can actually exploit these guarantees to um, allow the virtual machine to execute uh, directly on top of the underlying hardware's unprivileged mode. And then whenever uh, there is a trap, you can actually handle that particular instruction's em uh, emulation and then pass back control so that execution can continue. This would give you much better performance than instruction interpretation, but the problem here is that not all, not, not all architectures support it. In fact, uh, two of the most prevalent architectures uh, today, uh, the Intel x86 and the ARM architecture, actually are not strictly virtualizable according to this formal definition, uh, primarily because they do have some instructions that do not uh, either trap or execute identically on both of the uh, privileged and unprivileged modes. The trap costs themselves can be very high sometimes, even on architectures that do support this strict virtualizability property. Um, and the other problem is that the virtual machine monitor itself actually ends up consuming the privilege level because you are executing all of the virtual machines in the unprivileged level. Um, and this actually leads to uh, a need to virtualize the memory protection levels, which I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, while talking about memory virtualization. Uh, the, this is actually a particular concept called ring compression, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, but there are these several issues with even the trap and emulate model, which leads to another alternative called binary translation. Um, the idea here is that you would actually uh, look at the virtual machine's uh, current execution, look at its current, uh, currently being executed set of instructions, and you will look at specifically a basic block, which you can think of as a block of instructions, uh, a, a block of straight line instructions that ends with a control flow instruction. You look at this basic block, you, when you inspect that basic block, you basically try to translate uh, each instruction one by one, uh, where you would, you would translate all of the non-sensitive instructions identically, which are usually called ident translations. And you would translate all of the sensitive instructions to either their emulated uh, instruction, uh, instruction sequence or to a call to an emulation routine, if, if the emulation happens to be very sophisticated. So in this particular example, for uh, instance, you have an instruction like move EBX, comma EAX. Th this is all Intel x86 code, by the way. Um, so you have a, 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 a move EBX, comma EAX instruction, which is uh, you know, a harmless instruction as far as virtualization is concerned, and therefore you will translate it identically. Uh, you have another instruction like the CLI and the STI, which stands for clear interrupts and set interrupts, where the idea is you're either disabling or enabling interrupts. In this case, you actually do not want the virtual machine to be able to directly uh, control the interrupt enable status on the underlying hardware because that would uh, uh, you know, violate the isolation property. And therefore, you would uh, want to translate it to an emulation of the CLI or the STI uh, semantics. So in this case, for example, in, in the case of CLI, we actually end up uh, setting a particular memory word called the CPUIE, where, where we are basically uh, representing the virtual machine's interrupt enable status in memory to zero, for example, when it says CLI. And when it says STI, you set it to one and also check for pending interrupts and so on and so forth. But the idea here is basically that uh, you would, on the go, uh, you know, while dynamically executing the guest, you would keep translating the code uh, onto a separate uh, piece of memory called the translation cache, and you would keep executing off of this translation cache. And then this way, you would actually not have to necessarily trap on all of these sensitive instructions. You could actually end up uh, uh, executing the emulations in line with the, with the original instructions themselves. Uh, 
the idea here is not only that it helps you with the performance property by avoiding certain traps, but the, it's also important to note that you can actually use binary translation on architectures that do not support the trap and emulate strict virtualizability model. So this was actually used, for example, on uh, VMware's uh, products, uh, virtualization products for the x86 architecture way back w in the late 90s when uh, uh, the Intel x86 did not have any kind of virtualiza hardware virtualization support, when it was actually not strictly virtualizable. Uh, there are issues with binary translation as well. You know, uh, th there's the issue of translation cache management where you need to uh, make sure that the translation cache itself is coherent with the original instructions themselves, because whenever the virtual machine itself changes the instructions, you would want the translation cache also to reflect that change. Uh, there's also all kinds of other issues with it, which I'll not go into in too much detail today. Um, but uh, one of the things is, for example, self-modifying code, you know, where uh, uh, whenever the guest code that you translated changes, you would want to reflect the change on the translation cache. Um, there's also the other problem where you would you would like to protect the VMM itself from the guest. Specifically, you would you would want to uh, protect the translation cache from being accessed by the guest, but at the same time allow it to be executed and so on. Um, in fact, just dealing with binary translation and dealing with all of these issues itself is a very sophisticated topic, which is a research area by itself. And Robert Cohn is actually one of the researchers working in this area. And uh, you know, going into these issues would probably be a separate talk by itself. Um, there are other very interesting uses for binary translation outside of you know, uh, getting out of the trap and emulate model that I talked about just now. Um, one application I already touched upon, which was the cross ISA translation. For example, Apple's Rosetta software used that. Uh, there's also uh, binary translation being used for optimizations, like in the case of HP Dynamo and so on. Um, and of course, you, you all know that high-level languages themselves, uh, like Java and .NET, use bytecode translators, where, where they actually use just-in-time translation to do this kind of binary translation. Um, Another alternative, so we've already looked at instruction interpretation, we've looked at trap and emulate, we've looked at binary translation. Another alternative to do uh, system ISA virtualization would be para-virtualization. And the idea here, the, the most important, you know, sort of the, the key idea here is you are presenting a software interface to the virtual machine that is similar but not necessarily identical. In fact, in this case, almost always not identical to that of the underlying hardware. And once you take out the you know, strict requirement of being identical, you actually simplify the virtual machine monitor, you simplify uh, the, you, you eliminate the need for uh, trapping in, in various cases and so on. You actually lower the performance degradation of the VM's execution because you eliminate the need for certain traps. The drawback, of course, is that the guest operating system has to be ported to this similar but not identical interface to this what we call para API instead of the underlying hardware's API. The, you know, this typically involves making source modifications to replace all of the sensitive instructions or operations with what we call hypercalls, which is basically the equivalent of system calls, except that uh, these are system calls from the guest to the monitor instead of user mode to kernel mode. The, Paravirtualization itself can be implemented in, in different levels. So I, I give you, you know, two sort of uh, broad examples here. One is one I call shallow, pa shallow paravirtualization, where the idea is you would just replace uh, particular sensitive instructions with hypercalls. For example, you could imagine replacing the CLI instruction with a, um, a sequence that would do the CLI's equivalent, or with a hypercall uh, in more sophisticated cases. Um, Another would be what I call the deep para-virtualization case, where you would replace entire sensitive subsystems, not just particular instructions or particular parts of the code, uh, with alternatives. So for example, you could imagine simplifying the process model. Uh, you could imagine simplifying the amount of virtual address space available to a given guest process, for example. You could imagine simplifying the page table management by uh, you know, requiring the guest OS to actually make hypercalls whenever it makes changes to its page tables, and so on and so forth. Um, these different kinds of para-virtualization have different uh, 
levels that you need to uh, intervene in the case of making modifications to the guest. And they, of course, have different uh, trade-offs in terms of performance versus uh, requiring source modifications and all of that. Um, yet another alternative which has uh, you know, most recently uh, been brought up is hardware-assisted virtualization, uh, where the idea is you would actually make these architectures that are quote unquote problematic in terms of not uh, satisfying the strict virtualizability uh, requirement, uh, you would make them return to the classic trap and emulate model in hardware. So um, Intel and AMD, for example, have added uh, support called Intel VTX and AMD V. Um, ARM most recently, over the last year or so, has come out with uh, its own proposed set of virtualization extensions, uh, hardware-assisted virtualization, uh, virtualization extensions. All of these uh, basically you know, come down to uh, one set of simple uh, changes to the hardware. The hardware en enhancements would primarily enable you to uh, make the full virtualization of a given virtual machine or a guest OS uh, more efficient. Uh, they would actually simplify the virtual machine monitor significantly because the virtual machine monitor now does not have to uh, you know, be in the business of intervening at every one of these sensitive instructions and emulating the instruction semantics and so on. Um, the virtual machine monitor itself would get an exclusive privilege level so that it does not have to sort of share the same uh, you know, ring as the guest and you know, try to hide itself and do all these tricks. Uh, it allows, the config, it allows the monitor to actually configure certain instructions to trap into the monitor, and certain instructions uh, you know, need not have to tra trap into the monitor, and so on. Um, and last but not the least, it allows unmodified guest operating systems to actually run uh, natively and efficiently on the, uh, in a VM uh, on, on top of this hardware-assisted virtualization system. <clears throat> 